This has been a day of momentous change in the U.S. House of Representatives. Republicans began laying plans after finally nailing down a majority with at least 218 seats. And with the loss of the House confirmed, the Speaker, Nancy Pelosi, surrendered her longtime position as Democratic leader. Congressional correspondent Lisa Desjardins begins our coverage. At the Capitol, the House will be in order. A changing of the guard. With great confidence in our caucus, I will not seek re-election to Democratic leadership in the next Congress. A poignant moment for Speaker Nancy Pelosi as she announced she will step aside from her longtime leadership role. It has been with great pride in my 35 years in the House, I have seen this body grow more reflective of our great nation, our beautiful nation. <laughs> The Honorable Nancy Pelosi as a member from the state of California. A towering figure in American politics, in 2007, Pelosi became the first and so far only woman to be House Speaker. Never would I have thought that someday I would go from homemaker to House Speaker. After two decades in power, she will step out of leadership but remain in the House. Democrats will keep her expertise and voice. For my dear husband, Paul, who has been my beloved partner in life and my pillar of support. Last month, Pelosi's husband was attacked in their home, leaving him hospitalized. She has said the violence influenced her decision. You see the rhetoric that was going on that day, and you see what that man said coming into my home. You see a, a thread, and that's just not a something that has a place in our democracy. The anticipated and so far sole candidate to take her job is Democrat Hakeem Jeffries of New York. He and other House Democrats face a very different landscape after Republicans yesterday clinched a majority of races in the midterm elections and will take over in January. Republicans like incoming House Oversight Chair James Comer today previewing new investigations. We want to know what the Biden administration is trying to hide from the American people and why they are not being transparent. As they head home from a historic week, both parties are reconfiguring fast, with the new Congress set to begin in six weeks. And Lisa joins me now. Lisa, good to see you. Hi, you too. A big day on Capitol Hill. Yeah. You've been talking to your sources all day down there. What's the mood? What's going on? I'll say three words. Emotional, historic, and still divided. There was a lot of emotion for House Democrats and a sense of relief for them. This is a question that's been hovering over them for years of this idea of generational change. Uh, but there was also a divide on this historic day. When you looked at the House chamber, very few Republicans were there, and none of them were clapping, even in kind of giveaway lines like Praising the beauty of the Capitol. Those clapping on that side of the aisle were Democrats who were sitting there because of overflow. Now, Nancy Pelosi spoke to this a little bit, but tell us what does all this mean for Democratic uh, leadership? Quite a lot. <laughs> Let's look at who the current House Democratic leadership is, the top three leaders. Let's take a picture, look at the picture of these three leaders. There you go. Uh, Speaker Nancy Pelosi, and then, of course, Majority Leader right now, Steny Hoyer, and then Majority Whip, um, there we go, Clyburn right there. So these three leaders, let's talk about when they entered Congress, if you look at this by the numbers. Um, two of them elected in the 80s during the Reagan era, that's Pelosi and Hoyer, and then Clyburn in uh, just as President Clinton was coming into office. Now, let's look at who is poised to succeed them. These are not just the next generation, but actually skipping two generations. There you go, Hakeem Jeffries in the middle, Catherine Clark uh, to be the number two, and Peter Aguilar there um, to be the number three in the Democratic caucus. And it should be noted that this was a difficult choice, especially for Steny Hoyer of Maryland, who's the number two. He has wanted to be speaker for such a long time. He is stepping down from leadership, but like Pelosi, remaining in the House. Now, Clyburn is remaining in leadership, but in a slightly lower position. So you're going to have those three sort of senior members of the Democratic caucus still in, co in Congress, but they will be advising these leaders who are untested, these three, better for them to be in the minority probably as untested than otherwise. Um, also want to say it's important for the Democrats that Hoyer and Pelosi have frankly had a lot of tension between the two of them. And for Democrats I talked to today, they say they feel like this team mm -hmm. is actually more united and is going to be easy to get through. One last question, how unusual is it for a speaker to stay in the House and as a member? Well, let's look at this. Danny mm -hmm. Hastert, uh, I'm sorry, Dennis Hastert in 2007, he did this for 11 months. And then our great team, let's go back to 1790. 
Sandy, the first speaker of the House, of course, Frederick Muhlenberg, he actually stepped down as speaker and stayed for two years and went back and forth in leadership. Remember There's that. the Muhlenberg reference we were waiting for right. there. Thank you for that. The context for all of this, of course, is Republicans are now preparing to take control, right? Yeah. So what are they planning to do once that happens? Let's first talk about the margin that they're going to have to work with. Let's look at that graphic again that shows where we're at at this moment in terms of races called. Here we go, 218 Republicans. And then look at that, just that tiny amount of six races left to be called. Um, I think in the end, we're heading toward a majority of four or five seats for House Republicans. Now, Nancy Pelosi worked with that same kind of margin. She was able to get some legislation through. But one difference here, first of all, is that um, Kevin McCarthy has said he will not allow proxy voting. Uh, Nancy Pelosi was able to allow vote members to vote from their homes if they were, say, sick or if they had some other obligation. They didn't have to be here in town. Kevin McCarthy, no, they all have to be in their desks to vote, he says is what he's going to do. Other thing people know is that the House have the Freedom Caucus, which is a caucus which actually has formed and lived to be 30 or so members, which uses that leverage specifically to pressure their leaders. And that's a different dynamic than Pelosi Face. It's going to be much harder for Kevin McCarthy. All right, so let's talk about the agenda. Let's get back into <laughs> policy, not for the politics and the numbers, but you know what we know so far about what the Democrats or the Republicans are talking about investigations. Mm -hmm. um, I talked to um, uh, the oversight chairman coming in today, James Comer. He said that they're going to take their time in building their case. So don't expect hearings right away, at least on something like Hunter Biden. Also, they're talking about um, trying to roll back some of the Biden agenda. We'll see some of those bills pass. Um, things like the IRS agents uh, kind of adding that enforcement layer that passed through this Congress. That's something that we'll see House Republicans try to roll back. But as for their agenda, we're still waiting for more specifics on their proactive agenda. But we hear phrases like parental rights, education, those kinds of themes that they talked about on the campaign trail, um, budgeting, also the economy, how will they handle things like the debt ceiling. All of those are in the mix right now. We're going to be watching very carefully. Big day on Capitol Huge Hill. Huge day. Many more big How days. How lucky ahead. I am to cover history like this. How lucky we are to have you do it. <laughs> Lisa Desjardins, thank you so much. You're welcome.